Welcome back to the RSET training, Atmospheric Carbon Dioxide and Methane Budgets to Support the Global Stock Take. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm an RSET trainer based at Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Wherever you are joining from, we appreciate you taking the time to learn how NASA scientists estimate carbon dioxide and methane budgets to support the global stock take. Today is part two of a three-part webinar series occurring every Wednesday from May 11th to May 25th. In the second part of the webinar series, we'll be hearing from Dr. Brendan Byrne from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Dr. Dan Cussworth from the University of Arizona. As a reminder, all the course materials, including recordings from each webinar, PowerPoint presentations, homework assignment, and question and answer document can be found on the RSET training page provided at the link below. There will be one homework assignment for all three parts of the training. Answers must be submitted via Google Form, which can be accessed from the training page on the RSET website. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the due date of June 8th. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course for Marinas Martin. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brendan Byrne. Brendan is a postdoctoral candidate at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. His research inter interests are centered around improving our mechanistic understanding of the terrestrial carbon cycle. Brendan, over to you. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, so for today's objectives, we want to have everyone be able to describe the processes that um, add uh, CO2 and methane to the atmosphere and remove CO2 and methane from the atmosphere. Be able to explain how space-based, airborne, and ground-based measurements of CO2 and methane occur. Have an understanding of how CO2 and methane emissions and removals are estimated using inverse modeling. Understand how top-down CO2 stock loss estimates can be compared to inventories. And on this point, uh, you know, further details will be uh, covered in part three as well. And recognize methods for quantifying CO2 and methane emissions from localized sources. So first, uh, I just want to review some concepts from part one to, to remind everyone. So, in this uh, section, we are looking primarily from top-down uh, approaches, where you have a, a satellite or a surface um, site measuring the uh, concentration of carbon dioxide or methane in the atmosphere. And from that, you're inferring fluxes at the surface. And this is in contrast to the, the bottom-up inventories, which use kind of process estimates to scale up estimates of, of fluxes. The other concept from part one that I want to review is uh, stocks and fluxes. So you recall that you could have a reservoir, such as shown in this tub here, and the amount of you know, chemical or, or water or carbon dioxide contained in this reservoir is called the stock. For the atmosphere, this is typically measured in, you know, uh, concentration, such as the parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And then you can have, you know, carbon dioxide or methane, for example, enter this uh, reservoir through a source, which is a flux of carbon from one reservoir to another. So an example of this would be a release of CO2 from the land biosphere into the atmosphere. Um, and then you can have sinks removing you know, carbon dioxide from this reservoir. So for the atmosphere, this would be, for example, uh, carbon being taken up by the ocean or taken up by uh, plant growth and photosynthesis. 
So now turning back to looking at top-down CO2 and methane uh, methods for estimating fluxes. So top-down methods are used to quantify CO2 and methane budgets. The approaches for these two gases have a lot of similarities but some important differences. And so we're going to treat them somewhat differently in this course today. So the similarities are that the methods used to measure these gases are very similar and the remote sensing techniques are, are very similar. And the ways that we estimate surface atmosphere fluxes of these gases from these atmospheric measurements of CO2 or methane concentration are very similar in both uh, these inverse methods. But there's also some important differences. One is that the there's very different natural processes and human activities which emit and remove carbon dioxide and methane. And so, you know, their budgets are quite different from this perspective. And we often have different applications in performing um, flux estimates for these gases. So for example, for carbon dioxide, we might want to look at the land carbon stock change, whereas for methane, we might want to detect natural gas leaks. And those two different applications have different requirements for precision, accuracy, and spatial resolution. And so for that reason, we're going to treat these two gases kind of as different components in today's uh, course. So here's the outline for the course. So first we'll go over carbon dioxide. We'll first review processes that are emit and remove atmospheric CO2. We'll look at space-based, airborne, and ground-based measurements of carbon dioxide and how these are performed. We'll go over how inverse modeling uh, allows estimates of CO2 emissions and removals of carbon dioxide on regional and national scales. And we will um, estimate the carbon stock loss or the change in terrestrial carbon and show how these could be compared with national inventories. Then we'll switch over to methane. We'll similarly look at the processes that emit and remove atmospheric methane. We'll estimate methane emissions uh, on regional and national scales, how that's done. And we'll look at estimating methane emissions from intense localized sources. Okay, so for carbon dioxide, So now I want to go over uh, the background of how carbon dioxide moves through the Earth system and how anthropogenic activities are perturbing the carbon cycle. So first I want uh, you to think about you know, where the carbon comes from when you have a tree. So as you, know, you plant a seed and then you get a big tree, you know, where does all that mass, all the wood and carbon in that wood come from? And so it comes from the atmosphere, right? So through photosynthesis, the carbon is drawn out of the atmosphere and used to make the, the wood in a tree. And so you can kind of get an idea for how uh, carbon is exchanged between the land biosphere and the atmosphere through looking at this diagram here, how a tree grows over the course of a year. So in the spring, you have you know, all the leaves coming out and then throughout the spring and into the summer, you have photosynthesis going on within these leaves, which is converting atmospheric carbon dioxide into uh, chemicals that can be used by the plant to grow. Then at the end of the growing season, you have all the leaves dying and falling off. And many of these are then decomposed by bacteria. And a lot of that carbon is released back to the atmosphere. And then in the winter, you know, you have a pretty dormant plant and then the whole process repeats. So from a CO2 perspective, you have atmospheric CO2 being taken out of the atmosphere and going into the plant during the summer. And then in the fall, you have a, a lot of this carbon that was uptake and released back to the atmosphere. So now if we think about kind of these processes and other processes over the global scale, we can, you know, count to how uh, carbon moves through the whole Earth system. So there's 
a, a bunch of different processes that are continually ongoing moving carbon around. So as I was mentioning before, you have photosynthesis, which is drawing carbon out of the atmosphere and into the terrestrial biosphere. This is actually a very large flux over the course of a year. All these gross fluxes are shown on the right here. So, so the removals of carbon dioxide through photosynthesis is about 560 petagrams of CO2. So this is a huge amount of carbon drawn out of the atmosphere. But at the same time, over the course of the year, you have almost the exact same amount of carbon released back to the atmosphere through plant respiration. So plants themselves respire CO2 through their metabolism. And then also you have you know, wood and, and plant material being decomposed by microbes. And this decomposition releases CO2 back to the atmosphere. And so this uh, photosynthesis and respiration both produce some large fluxes of carbon dioxide going in the opposite directions. But over the course of the year, they're approximately balanced. So you have very little net flux of carbon between, between the atmosphere and the biosphere. Uh, similarly, there's processes moving carbon between the atmosphere and the ocean. So this flux of carbon between the atmosphere and the ocean is largely due to partial pressure differences. So if you basically have a higher concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere than in the ocean, it will defeat the carbon dioxide will diffuse into the water. Or similarly, if you have higher carbon dioxide in the water, then the atmosphere will diffuse up into the atmosphere. And so emissions and removals by uh, the ocean are also very large, about 330 petagrams of C a year, but the carbon dioxide is uptaken and released by almost exactly the same amount. And so you have very uh, small net flux uh, between the two processes. Now, human activities are a bit different. So in particular, uh, in recent times, the largest emission of CO2 from anthropogenic activities has been due to the combustion of fossil fuels. And so here you have an emission of geologic carbon to the atmosphere, which is smaller than the one-way fluxes of carbon moving between the land biosphere and the atmosphere and the ocean and the atmosphere. But what's important is that it's all moving in the same direction. So you have about 40 petagrams of CO2 emitted to the atmosphere, but you have almost none being removed. And so in effect, um, on an annual net time scale, these emissions are, are larger than any of the net fluxes you see between the biosphere and the atmosphere or the ocean and the atmosphere. So what we can do is we can look at data sets of the amount of fossil fuels burned and the amount of land use activities such as deforestation that have occurred and how much CO2 has been released from the geologic and biospheric reservoirs to the atmosphere through these anthropogenic activities. And so you can see on the left here, this is the flux of CO2 to the atmosphere through fossil fuel and land use emissions um, for each year going back to about 1930s. And you can see that the, the release of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere has been increasing over time with a slight decrease in the flux during 2020, during the COVID, um, but still always positive releasing carbon dioxide to the atmosphere throughout this period. Now we can calculate you know, how much carbon dioxide is being released to the atmosphere and how much that should be increasing atmospheric CO2. So if we convert this flux to the atmosphere into how much carbon dioxide should be in the atmosphere, we come up with this red line. And so over time, you see this positive flux is driving carbon dioxide up and up and up and up. But we, to confirm whether these anthropogenic CO2 activities are actually driving atmospheric CO2 up this much, we have to look at measurements of atmospheric CO2. And so we have measurements from Mauna Loa, Hawaii, they go back to 1958, and those are shown in this black line. And what you see is that actually the amount atmospheric CO2 has been increasing is much less than you would expect based off how much carbon dioxide we've been releasing to the atmosphere through anthropogenic activities. So I want you know, everyone to think to themselves, how is this possible? How could we have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increasing less than we would expect given how much we emit? Well, the answer is that all the carbon dioxide we're emitting to the atmosphere is not staying in the atmosphere. 
So this plot here is um, from the Global Carbon Project um, in Friedelstein uh, et al. 2021. And it's showing uh, the CO2 flux above zero being the CO2 flux to the atmosphere through anthropogenic activities. So in the orange here, you have things like uh, net land use change emissions. So these are from things like deforestation. And in the gray area, you have the fossil fuel emissions for each year. Now below zero on this line is showing where the CO2 actually ends up. So about 41% of it remains in the atmosphere. And this is what's causing that rise, uh, observed rise in atmospheric CO2 that I plotted previously. But what is also happening is that there are natural sinks of carbon dioxide that are removing some of this anthropogenic CO2 and from the atmosphere and sequestering it in the oceans. So the oceans absorb about 26% of these anthropogenic CO2 emissions. And this is largely driven by this partial pressure difference. So as carbon dioxide is building up in the atmosphere, that drives a concentration difference between the atmosphere and the ocean. And so it drives a flux of carbon moving from the atmosphere and into the ocean. And then we have about 30%, which is absorbed by terrestrial ecosystems. So this absorption by terrestrial ecosystems is uh, much less understood. It is partially uh, impacted by anthropogenic activities. See, this is releasing a lot of carbon dioxide through land use emissions, but there's also things like reforestation, which can drive carbon uptake if, say, uh, somewhere that was previously farmland was left to regrow as a forest. But there's also other processes such as CO2 fertilization, which is basically meaning that it's easier for plants to do photosynthesis when the concentration of CO2 is higher, and things like climate change in some regions, such as at high latitudes where it's warming and, and the biosphere is becoming more productive, they can contribute to this sink. But currently, um, you know, the main drivers of this uptake of carbon dioxide by the terrestrial biosphere is not very well understood and is likely very variable by region, such as the tropics versus the high latitudes. So now I want to bring us to uh, the data set that we're creating here and the goals of our top down global stock take CO2 data set. So the driving question for this data set is really what are the net CO2 emissions and removals for countries? As I showed previously, we have a pretty good understanding of the net uh, emissions and removals on a global scale, but the uncertainties become much larger as we move down to country scales. And this is something that these top-down constraints can help inform. And so the first question is, what are the net CO2 emissions and removals for countries? And the second is, what is the change in terrestrial carbon stocks for countries? Uh, this change in terrestrial carbon stocks is key because it relates to the constraining of agriculture, forestry, and other land use emissions, which are important for things like the Paris Agreement. So the method we use here is uh, to first make measurements of atmospheric CO2 at high spatial and temporal resolution over the globe. And I'll go over the different types of ways we make these measurements. Perform flux inversions to estimate surface atmosphere fluxes based off these atmospheric CO2 data. And I'll go over how this is done. And then finally, derive the loss of land carbon stocks using these data and ancillary uh, data sets. So first I wanna give an idea of how this general concept works and the, the concept behind a CO2 flux inversion. So you can imagine here that there is a parcel of air. You then go and you measure the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. For example, you find a concentration of 415 parts per million. You then watch this mass of air um, be, you know, move with the wind over a forest and then continues again and you make another measurement. And now you find that it's 
uh, decreased from 415 parts per million to 412 parts per million. And so the question we're really trying to ask with these inverse methods is, you know, how much carbon was taken up by that forest? And from these two measurements, we can estimate this because we know that the concentration changed by 3 ppm. And so we know that air mass must have lost 3 ppm's worth of carbon dioxide. And so this is kind of a simple illustration of how this process works. In reality, it's much more challenging uh, than it may appear at first. And the reason for this is kind of illustrated by this animation. And the reason for this is illustrated by this animation. So this is showing the uh, model simulation of the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And what you can see is that it's very complicated. There's a lot of carbon dioxide swirling around by the winds. And looking at this animation directly, it's not that obvious where the emissions and removals are. So you can see some areas such as China here, there's a lot of fossil fuel emissions or the Eastern US where there's a lot of fossil fuel emissions where CO2 builds up downwind. But overall, it's quite a complex system. And so to really understand how much carbon dioxide is being released and taken up by different countries, we need uh, a weather forecast model that's able to simulate how carbon dioxide is moving around the atmosphere, like is shown here, as well as dense measurements of atmospheric CO2. So we can clearly track where carbon dioxide has been increasing and decreasing as it circulates around the atmosphere. So now we'll go through the different types of measurements of atmospheric CO2 that we make um, and use in these flux inversion systems. So the first data set is in situ measurements. So these measurements are made you know, in a flask or uh, an in situ inlet, very local measurements, where you're measuring basically the carbon dioxide at one very small location. And this is on the right showing an example of this. So this is in Mauna Loa, Hawaii, where we've had measurements since 1958. So you have uh, basically a small inlet taking in some air and measuring how much carbon dioxide is in that air. These data are very precise and accurate, which is very important in estimating sources and sinks. But the disadvantage of these data is that they're very sparsely located. And so on the left here is showing the distribution of these in situ CO2 measurements over the period 2015 through 2020, which our data set covers fluxes for. And so this, this color bar here is showing how many observations you have at these different sites over 2015, 2020. And what you see is that where you're having dense, like frequent measurements, so many of these sites multiple times a day, are all occurring over basically North America, uh, Europe, and a few sites in Russia. While measurements outside these regions are uh, very sparse and much more infrequent. So a lot of these sites are only measuring but once a week. And so these data are very powerful for capturing large scale signals and also capturing emissions and, and removals of carbon dioxide over certain regions such as North America and Europe. But for many places in the world, such as South America, Africa, and much of Asia, um, the data density is, is quite sparse, which makes estimating country level uh, emissions and removals quite challenging. Now, more recently, over the past decade or so, there's been a big expansion of these satellite measurements that measure carbon dioxide. So the way this works is basically, you have a satellite here, which is orbiting the earth, and it measures the sunlight, uh, which comes down, is reflected off the earth's surface, and then goes up to the instrument. So it measures the spectrum of, of wavelengths from the sun, 
and it looks at how much carbon dioxide um, absorbed certain wavelengths of the sunlight. And based off how much uh, sunlight was absorbed at these certain wavelengths, it allows you to calculate how much carbon dioxide is in this path going through the atmosphere down to the surface and then back up to the satellite. And so we often call this a measurement of XCO2 or the average concentration throughout the atmosphere. This plot on the right is showing the distribution of these measurements by the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2. As you can see, it makes much more spatially uniform observations than uh, in situ measurements do. And it also measures over both the land and the ocean. A bit of a challenge with these measurements though is that they depend on reflected sunlight, so they're seasonally variable. So for example, at the high latitudes it, in the Northern X tropics, you have good measurements in the summer, but then in the winter, you don't have very strong reflected sunlight, so you lose those measurements. This satellite orbits um, around the Earth from um, or, or around the poles. So it goes from the North Pole to the South Pole to the North Pole to the South Pole. Um, it continuously collects data over a narrow 10 kilometer uh, swath. So these, you see these uh, thin tracks. Each one of those tracks is for a single orbit. Um, as I mentioned previously, we, we measure XCO2 from it, or the total column carbon dioxide. And these measurements occur whenever it's not blocked by clouds and there's sufficient reflected sunlight to make the measurement. And there's limits in high latitude measurements, as I mentioned previously. All right, so these are what the OCO2 measurements look like over this entire 2015 to 2020 period. And we split them up into land and ocean data for some reasons I'll explain here, mainly due to issues with the quality of the retrievals. So for the land data, as you can see, they're very spatially extensive and they cover a lot of remote areas that are not captured by the in situ measurements. The ocean data similarly are very spatially extensive, covering you know, large ocean areas where there's, there's no in situ measurements. The challenge with both these OCO2 land data and ocean data is that there can be uh, residual biases in the estimates. So it's a very complicated measurement trying to infer the, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through these sunlight observations. And you can have different factors such as how many aerosols there are in the atmosphere or the surface that the light is reflecting off of that can cause these very small biases in the retrievals they can sometimes negatively impact estimated fluxes from these data. For the OCO2 land data, we believe the quality of these retrievals to be very high. And we think that in most cases, retrieval biases are not a major concern, although there could still be uh, regionally structured biases that may impact the results in some places. For the ocean data, biases in the retrievals are still quite a major concern and we think that flux inversions that incorporate these um, these ocean glint data should be viewed quite skeptically and so you know I, I, we're going to caution anyone uh, against using the the data sets we provide that include these ocean glint data okay so all right, those are the measurements that we make. And now I want to talk about how we estimate fluxes from them using these inversion methods. So basically the way inverse modeling works is it allows us to estimate the surface atmospheric CO2 flux, which is able to match these atmospheric CO2 observations. And the way this is done is that we take our best prior knowledge of CO2 fluxes 
so how much fossil fuel emissions are releasing, um, an estimate of atmosphere or ocean fluxes, which we can get things from things like uh, ocean measurements of the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and our best estimates of biosphere atmosphere fluxes, which we can get from things like terrestrial biosphere models. We then take these flux estimates and put them in a weather forecast model, similar to, as I showed that animation before, that was performed with one of these weather forecast type models. So we simulate basically a model atmosphere, so how what carbon dioxide should look like in our model atmosphere. We then measure our model atmosphere in the same way actual measurements measure the real atmosphere. And we compare our model atmosphere with the real atmosphere. Now, if there's a mismatch, say the real measurements uh, show that carbon dioxide is higher than our model atmosphere uh, suggests, then we know that our fluxes are too, uh, our, our emissions are too low, and we need to emit more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and then increase our model uh, CO2 value to match the observed value. And so, you know, this is a very complicated process, and I think that's enough detail for this. I, I'm happy to follow up with people if they have uh, more detailed questions about how these flux inversion systems work. Okay, so, you know, for the data set we're producing here, we uh, use an ensemble of these flux inversion systems. So this is all part of what's called the OCO2 Model Intercomparison Project. And so this is a, a large group of flux inversion modelers who have come together and all perform uh, these flux inversions and estimate surface atmosphere fluxes with their own models. And the reason that we have this big group of modelers come together is because we know that no model is perfect and no flux inversion is perfect. So by performing these, exper these calculations with a bunch of different models, we're be better able to understand, you know, how robust our results are to different flux inversion setups. For this OCO2 model comparison project, fluxes are estimated for six years from 2015 through 2020. And four different experiments are performed. So one is an in situ experiment, which measures, um, which we call the IS experiment, and it uses these in situ CO2 measurements to estimate surface atmosphere fluxes of carbon dioxide. The next one we call our LNLG experiment, and this uses all the OCO2 land measurements to estimate surface fluxes. Then we have one that combines the OCO2 land measurements with these in situ data called the LNLGIS experiment. And then we have finally one that combines all the land data, the OCO2 ocean data, and the in-situ data called the LNLGOGIS experiment. And these experiments kind of fall along a continuum where for the in-situ experiment, we know that the data quality is very good. So we know we have unbiased data going into these models, uh, but we know that the in-situ data is very sparse. So we don't have very much data going into it, and this is gonna limit our ability to look at countries, especially in the tropics. On the other end, we have lots and lots of data going into the inversion. So we have all the OCO2 land data, all the OCO2 ocean data, and all the in-situ data going in to constrain fluxes. Now this gives us you know, very good observational coverage to estimate country net fluxes across the globe and in the tropics, everywhere. But the problem is that, you know, we are suspect that some of these data, particularly these ocean glint data, have some biases in them that might cause our results to be biased. And so we don't know how much we should really trust the uh, fluxes we get from this experiment. And then in the middle, um, we have these, the, LNLG experiment using the OCO2 land data and the LNLG IS experiment using the OCO2 land data and the in situ data. Uh, 
So yeah, these points basically just cover the points I made there. So each group within the OCO2 uh, MIP provides estimates of net carbon exchange. And so this net carbon exchange is the net flux of carbon dioxide between the Earth's surface and the atmosphere over land, and is the combination of fossil fuel emissions and any fluxes between the biosphere and the atmosphere, which we call net biosphere exchange. So each of the um, flux inversion systems participating in the OCO2 model comparison project provide these flux estimates on a one by one degree spatial grid, one degree latitude, one degree longitude. So we aggregate these fluxes that are provided on this one by one degree grid to country totals. And we take the mean, or sorry, the median of all the different models as our best estimate. And we take the standard deviation across these models as our estimate of uncertainty. So on the right here, you can see uh, what these net carbon exchange fluxes look like averaged over 2015 to 2020 for one of the experiments. So this is the LNLGIS experiment. If you look at the, the top plots, this is showing the median value and the uncertainty at one by one degree spatial resolution. You can see that there's a lot of these red dots over, all over the place, and these are fossil fuel emissions. So for example, you see in China, very strong fossil fuel emissions. You see um, over the US strong emissions, for example, in Los Angeles where I am down here. Um, and then in Europe. Now these kind of specs of very strong emissions through fossil fuel uh, are on top of kind of these broad structures. For example, this blue up here um, showing net uptake by the biosphere. So this is removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in the blue over these kind of diffuse areas. And in the tropics, you see you again have these diffuse signals, but they are both positive and negative, uh, indicating regional emissions and regional um, uptake. Now, if we aggregate these one by one degrees to the countries, what we see is that most countries are red, meaning that there is a net emission of CO2 from the land um, resulting in increasing atmospheric CO2. And this is mostly due to fossil fuel emissions, which is driving, of course, a year on year increase in the atmospheric CO2 amount. This is particularly true in the northern extropics, so such as like over the US, Europe, and China, you see these large emissions. In the tropics, you see somewhat more variable signals where some places suggest more uptake and some suggest more release. If we look at the uncertainties here, though, we also see that the uncertainties are quite a bit larger in the tropics, um, and they are also larger for smaller countries. And this is because, you know, atmospheric CO2 data best constrains large countries and has a harder time resolving these smaller uh, countries because the gradients in atmospheric CO2 from emissions and removals over these countries are smaller. All right, so that shows the, um, the fundamental constraint atmospheric CO2 provides in these flux inversion systems, which is the net uh, carbon exchange or the net flux between the land and the atmosphere. But to try to make our data more useful for inventory accounting and the global stock take, we derive estimates of changes in land carbon stocks. And this is particularly useful for monitoring emissions and removals from the AFALU sector. So here we quantify land carbon stock losses. And this is estimated by combining these top-down uh, net carbon exchange estimates from the flux inversions with other carbon flux data sets, which are primarily bottom up. Okay, so to calculate this land carbon stock loss, we take the net carbon exchange from the flux inversions and subtract off fossil fuel emissions 
and lateral fluxes of carbon. This can be visualized a little bit uh, easier in this diagram on the right here. So basically, the flux inversions from the OCO2 model into comparison project give us a constraint on this net flux between the land and the atmosphere. This flux is itself composed of the fossil fuel emissions and net uh, biosphere exchange, which is the net flux between the land biosphere reservoir and the atmospheric reservoir. Then finally, to calculate the, the carbon loss or the change in this reservoir, we need to subtract off any carbon that is not directly moved between the atmosphere and the biosphere, but also carbon that is moved laterally. So this includes things like lateral fluxes from rivers, which can transport carbon from the land to the ocean, or uh, lateral fluxes of carbon through things like crop harvesting or wood harvesting. So after subtracting off these quantities, we end up with our estimate of the land carbon stock loss. So this is just showing in terms of maps, kind of what it looks like when we're calculating this land carbon stock loss. So we start off with our model median uh, net carbon exchange, which I showed earlier from the experiment. We subtract off the fossil fuel emissions, and then we subtract off these lateral fluxes, which are generally much smaller. We also estimate uncertainties on our um, land carbon stock loss in quadrature, meaning that we um, sum all the uncertainties on these different components together with the uncertainties in the net carbon exchange from the flux inversion generally being the dominant component of uncertainty. All right, so now we can take a look at uh, what the results look like for these four different OCO2 uh, model and comparison project experiments. So on the right here, I'm showing, so for example, on the top left is showing the carbon stock loss for the in situ experiment. So this is shown such that uh, negative values indicate a uh, loss of carbon from the atmosphere and uptake of terrestrial carbon by the biosphere, whereas positive values are showing a release of carbon from the biosphere and an increase in atmospheric CO2. On the right is showing the uncertainties in these estimates for the in situ experiment. Now these different rows are showing the results for different OCO2 MIP experiments. So the top is for the in situ experiment. The second one is for the LNLG experiment. The third one is for the LNLG IS experiment. And the bottom one is for the LNLG OG IS experiment. A consistent result uh, that we find across these experiments is that there is a negative flux, so land carbon gain across the northern high latitudes, meaning that these ecosystems are drawing carbon out of the atmosphere and increasing the amount of carbon stored in the terrestrial biosphere. We also see a positive flux throughout the tropics in all the experiments, uh, indicating uh, a loss of land carbon over the tropics. However, the regional structure of the fluxes in the tropics are quite uh, variable across experiments. For example, the in situ experiment shows this to be quite a, a uniform feature across the tropics with no strong country to country differences, while the LNLG and other uh, inversions containing OCO2 data show this to be quite regionally structured with quite large losses of terrestrial carbon and emission to the atmosphere over northern sub-Saharan Africa and northern South America and over um, Indonesia. But uh, uptake or increases in land carbon over kind of the southern sub-Saharan Africa and across Argentina and a lot of the uh, west coast of South America. <clears throat> 
You also see on the right that many of these regions in the tropics and particularly smaller countries are, are more uncertain in their flux estimates. So why do we see these differences between the in-situ and the OCO2 containing experiments? There's several possible factors that could be driving this. One is the lack of in-situ data. As I showed before, there's very few in-situ data over the tropics. Um, another possibility is that there may be uh, re residual retrieval biases in the OCO2, XCO2 data, which could be causing some of these structures. So we have the highest confidence um, in these estimates when they are consistent across the experiments, um, excluding this uh, LNLGOGIS experiment, which we are suspect of because we don't really trust the OCO2 ocean glint data. All right, we can also plot um, these results up for individual countries here. So, so recall that the fossil fuel emissions plus these lateral fluxes plus the carbon loss is equal to this net carbon exchange. And so what these figures are showing are these different components of the fossil. So for example, for the USA, we have the fossil fuel emissions are releasing a lot of carbon to the atmosphere. So very positive flux towards the atmosphere. We have river export and crop and, crop and trade um, fluxes, which are, are very small overall. And then we have a, a negative carbon stock loss, so meaning this is negative, so carbon is being drawn out of the atmosphere and into the terrestrial biosphere. And when you add all these together, you get the net carbon exchange on the right showing a uh, release to the atmosphere, uh, which is large, but not quite as large as the fossil fuel emissions would suggest because there's this compensating uptake by the terrestrial biosphere. Now, um, these different lines here, as shown in Australia, are for the different experiments. So each of these experiments has its own net carbon exchange estimate and resulting carbon stock loss estimate. So that's the case for the USA, but you can see the different countries have kind of different stories. So India shows similar results to US with very positive fossil fuels and negative uh, carbon uptake, resulting in a, a net carbon exchange, which is somewhat lower than the fossil fuel emissions. In Indonesia, you actually have a uh, carbon stock loss, which is similar to the fossil fuel emissions. And so the actual net carbon exchange over Indonesia is larger than you'd expect just accounting for the fossil fuel emissions because the terrestrial biosphere is losing carbon and releasing that carbon to the atmosphere. Well, as for Australia, you have, um, you know, kind of more neutral biosphere. All right, since we calculate these values for um, six years, you can also look at the time series of these fluxes. So this is again showing on the left here for the USA, where you have you know, your net carbon exchange over each of these years for each of the experiments with the shaded area showing the uncertainty. Then here you have the fossil fuel emissions up here and then these different uh, lateral fluxes of carbon down here. And then you have this carbon stock loss at the bottom. You can see some countries have very large vari seasonal variations in the carbon stock loss, such as Indonesia and Australia. So in Australia, for example, 2016 was a very wet year. And so you have quite negative values here, meaning a lot of carbon was drawn out of the atmosphere and taken up by the biosphere. So it's increasing the amount of land carbon here. And then 2019 was the, the hottest and driest year on record in Australia. And you see that actually there was a carbon released to the atmosphere so that so the land biosphere lost carbon. And that, that's actually, you know, uh, climate variability is kind of a, a large driver of the year to year variations in land carbon stock loss um, on top of kind of long term trends. All right. So uh, reviewing what we've gone over here and what this data set uh, that we've created provides. So the data set provides annual net fluxes over a six year period, so 2015 to 2020. Uh, we provide fluxes for each country, and we also look at certain regions. 
So we have provided the African Union, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, and the European Union. We provide these estimates for four different experiments, net uh, for uh, in situ, LNLG, LNLGIS, and LNLGOGIS. And for each of these experiments, we provide a net carbon exchange, net biosphere exchange, and the land carbon stock loss. We also provide the bottom-up fluxes used to drive the carbon stock loss, so the fossil fuel emissions and the lateral fluxes of carbon due to uh, crop trade, wood trade, and river export. And we also provide some quantities that help interpret the robustness of these flux estimates, um, such as the Z statistics and influence of assimilated data. But I will wait until part three to describe what those, how those are used. Okay, so the uh, key takeaways of the CO2 section of this presentation. So, you know, 50% of the anthropogenic CO2 emissions that are released to the atmosphere don't stay in the atmosphere. They're in fact absorbed by the land biosphere and the oceans. These atmospheric CO2 flux inversions provide regional emissions and removals of CO2 uh, from atmospheric CO2 measurements using a transport model and data simulation techniques. The OCO2 model into comparison project provides estimates of net carbon exchange between the land and the atmosphere for four experiments that assimilate different atmospheric CO2 data sets. Um, and we estimate land carbon stock losses by combining these OCO2 monitor comparison and net carbon exchange constraints with inventories of fossil fuel emissions and lateral fluxes. Um, so try downloading the CO2 data set and plotting up some country totals uh, in preparation for part three, where we'll, where we'll go over um, the data set in a little more detail. And also be aware that a research paper accompanying this data set is gonna be coming uh, in June of this year. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Dan Cusworth um, to talk about methane. Okay, thank you so much, Brendan. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you all today about methane and how that relates to the global, global carbon cycle as well and some of the similarities that it has with CO2, but also some of the differences. And it's important to highlight highlight both of those. Even as some of these methods may seem very similar, these are different gases and there are different processes controlling them and the emission sources can also be a little bit different. But before I get into that, I just wanna introduce myself a little bit. I'm Dan Cussworth. I am a research scientist at the University of Arizona. I'm also the project scientist for the Carbon Mapper mission and I was uh, formerly at NASA JPL as well. So let's dive right into this. So what I'm showing here is a figure, a nice figure of the global methane budget, or really where are all the sources and sinks of methane in the atmosphere? So starting on the left part of this panel, we can see where the sources come from. So fossil fuels, agriculture, biomass burning, and wetlands and natural sources. And then between these are natural and anthropogenic with fossil fuel and production, fossil fuel production and use in agriculture being, and waste being the main anthropogenic sectors. Now, methane is a little bit different than CO2 in the fact that the main dominant sink of methane, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, comes from the atmosphere. It's the reaction primarily of OA with OH, the hydroxyl radical, in addition to some other chemicals. This is how we remove methane from the atmosphere. Um, Another important thing to point out though, is that methane, going back to the emissions, is that methane emissions broadly fall into two main categories. One category is diffuse. So this isn't dissimilar to a lot of the CO2 sources that we talked about in the previous section. So these are, you know, per unit area, small emission sources, but when aggregated over a large region, can represent a huge source. So think about wetlands, for example. You have expansive wetlands that, you know, uh, expand acres, miles, kilometers across big regions in the tropics of the boreal forests. You know, maybe in one square small patch of that wetland is a very small emission source. But if you think about the whole 
the whole of the wetlands. It constitutes something big. Now we're going to contrast with that with another type of emission source, which generally comes mostly from anthropogenic sectors, though there are some natural sectors where this comes from as well, that are, that are localized. We call them localized. Um, some people call them super emitters, uh, or you could call them just a point source. So this comes from a very discrete location. So you can think of a leaking pipeline. You know, you have a big rupture in a pipeline. So you have a very discrete point source that is emit emitting a disproportionate amount of methane into the atmosphere. So when you're thinking about observing systems or constraining this, you have to keep both of these in mind. Going back to that, a little bit more into that diffuse source, and I was highlighting wetlands in particular, these can expand over really large areas. And they can be very, and they can be very uh, diffuse. So when you're thinking about measurement capabilities, what you really need is something that has a spatial coverage, but also a very precise, it's a very precise measurement because you're trying to capture something that's very diffuse. And so when constraining a global wetland budget from space, you want to make sure that you have some sort of imaging or satellite capability that can do just that. Gives you the spatial coverage with high precision. And now going back a little bit deeper into some of these other anthropogenic sectors that have both diffuse and point sources, we can start seeing a little bit, just if we look at a global map, of how that might arise. So you look at things like, you think of residential gas distribution systems. So you know. In a city where you have everybody who has a gas stove, every time they turn on that stove, there might be a little puff of methane gas that gets released. So these are really small sources that in aggregate create a larger source, but it's kind of a more of a diffuse source scattered across the city. Um, but then again, as I was saying, there's point sources. So you know, you look, you think, look at this map on the bottom of coal, you know, where you have coal mines or coal ventilation shafts. These are real discrete areas where you might expect a emission source emanating from an exact facility. And for that, you know, emission from that single event being disproportionate when compared to, uh, you know, the entire fossil fuel sector. Now, I talked uh, a little bit more about the way that methane is removed from the atmosphere. And something to highlight, again, it was brought up in section. Uh, in the first part of this training was, you know, the relative lifetimes of methane and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And this very much plays the role. You know, methane is a lot shorter lived of a gas in the atmosphere. You know, the scale of 10 to 20 years versus hundreds compared to CO2. A big part of this is because it has a very strong sink in the hydroxyl radical. Um, and there's also some, you know, variability that can occur due to events like, you know, El Nino, the ENSO cycle, variations in biomass burning, which may have a connection to ENSO. This is a really hot area of research. So even though the removal mechanisms of methane may be constrained to just a couple of different sources, really primarily this hydroxyl OH radical, there's still a huge amount of uncertainty in what the global distribution of OH is. Um, it's, it's very hard to measure this globally. It's very hard to have proxies that can measure this that are reliable long term. Um, lots of these are model simulations from uh, chemical transport models is how we constrain our understanding of OH. So there is a considerable amount of uncertainty and really variation in that OH radical can have a huge effect on what uh, you know the year to year variability of methane is, or even the long-term trends. So, you know, I, I won't go into every detail here, but just to say that even though it's maybe simpler conceptually that methane has primarily just one removal mechanism, there's a huge amount of uncertainty in that removal mechanism. And there's a, it's a very important area of research as we go forward and really try to understand um, the trend in methane as we have seen methane concentrations in the atmosphere are, seem to be accelerating. So really understanding what's happening to the sink is critical to that. Okay, well, let's, that's a little bit of the background of 
you know, methane, its sources and its sinks. Now let's get back to budgets and uh, inventories and what can we say with um, top-down observations to get at inventory scales. So again, this was touched on in part one, but just like with CO2, we can assimilate uh, column average concentrations of methane in the atmosphere to get at fluxes. Then we can go from fluxes and we can estimate sectors. That's very complicated, but here I'm showing you know, a schematic of how this was done in a recent study by John Warden in 2021. So on the left panel, the top left panel, this is mean uh, column methane concentrations from the GOSAT satellite, uh, mean over, yeah, for 2019. They took these concentrations and propagated them through an inverse framework to get at methane fluxes at a one by one gridded scale. Now from there, because there was information in their prior inventories about what the contribution from each of the emission sectors was to those fluxes, so fossil fuel, you know, waste, natural, et cetera, they could then project those fluxes to emission sectors and their uncertainties. And because it was at a higher resolution of one by one degree scale, for many of the countries where there was enough information content at that spatial resolution, they could aggregate that to come up with sector-based national estimates and then compare that with the bottom-up inventories that also exist. And so you can see from this plot, there's broad agreement for many of these countries and many of these sectors. There's also disagreement in other ones. So, you know, you look at Brazil, natural, you know, it seems as if the top down and the bottom up are in agreement. The top down seems to reduce the uncertainty in that. Um, but if you look at, you know, another sector, for example, uh, the top in the United States, the natural sources, so here's, that's primarily wetland, the top down is actually saying, you know what, maybe it's not as high of an emission in the United States. Then conversely, in the fossil fuel sectors, again, if we look at Russia, the bottom-up inventory actually expects really high uh, emissions for the uh, fossil, so oil and gas and coal. But the top-down constraint is saying, you know what, it, to reconcile with the atmospheric observations that we have, this would predict a lower emission rate. Now, we've talked a lot in the previous sections how there's uncertainties inherent in both of these top-down and bottom-up methods. But what's really important here is that we are comparing them. So where we see the discrepancies, this is a place that we can start looking laser focus in and say, okay, now let's understand why we have these discrepancies. Do we trust the atmospheric observations? Do we trust the inventories? Are there reasons why we should or shouldn't trust those? Do we trust the atmospheric transport models in these regions that are relating these concentrations to these fluxes? These are all open questions and there's probably not a uniform answer that works for every country. There's gonna be varying levels of fidelity uh, in the bottom up inventories that we have in some of the countries. Um, there will also be, it's also more difficult to run a atmospheric transport model in some countries as it is in other ones. The tropics are a little bit harder. Vertical mixing is a little bit harder. So it's, this is what I consider to be a starting point into how we then go about reconciling these differences. But it shows you how we can do these comparisons, and that's very important. Um, so what I showed previously was total budgets. You think of national inventories, the sum of everything. But like I mentioned, there can be many point sources within a basin, within a country, within a region that have a disproportionate contribution to the total emissions. And so here's a study that um, I led in the Permian Basin, where we took a imaging, an airborne imaging spectrometer. Now this is uh, a different class of, uh, of, of instrument than what has been previously shown or compared to the previous slide like GOSEP. This now, an imaging spectrometer like this that has, has coarser spectral resolution, which results in a less precise measurement but it has much higher spatial resolution. And by having much higher spatial resolution, that means that we can do almost 
perfect source attribution. It means we can delineate plumes. If we can take an image at three meters spatial resolution, which is what I'm showing on the left, that means we can see exactly where we have strong concentrations and strong uh, plumes of methane. But because we are a low precise instrument, we are not able to quantify the total contribution of methane within this region. We're only able to quantify those real discrete localized point sources. But, <laughs> so I, I hope that makes sense and I'm happy to clarify that in the questions. But again, what we can, and on the right is the, and the right is kind of the story then. It tells you about, this is a cumulative distribution of these emissions and it follows a power law. Basically what that is telling you is that a very small fraction, very small fraction of these plumes represents a disproportionate amount of methane that is emitted in this basin. So for example, this place we've imaged in the Permian Basin in uh, you know, West Texas and New Mexico, oil and gas basin, basically what we found was that plumes, so 1%, these high point source super emitter plumes, we only detected them at about 1% 1, 1 of all of the infrastructure. But together, they made up about 50% of that total flux. So this starts to become very important, again, from an inventory perspective and a mitigation perspective. Because from an inventory perspective, you can say, well, how do we construct inventories? Well, we take activity data, which can represent all the oil and gas wellheads you might have in a basin. So you say, I have 100,000 wells in a big basin. And then you multiply it by some emission factor. And usually that, those emission factors are based on some atmospheric observations or somebody went out and you know, sampled a small subset of facilities and said, okay, this is the average emission rate for a wellhead. You multiply the two together, you can come up with a budget. What we're finding is that in the methane world, you can have a very small class of emitters that have really high emission rates. So how do you take that into account when you're applying emission factors to an inventory? It's an open question, but it's an important one. The other thing is mitigation. If I can provide you an image of a plume at three meter spatial resolution, even if it's at 30 meter rates, uh, spatial resolution, may, you know, may, yeah, 30 meter, maybe 100 meters. And I say, look, this is a pretty big emission rate. Well, now I'm saying, okay, look, you don't have to go visit 100,000 wellheads in your basin. Maybe you only need to visit 1% of them if you need to figure out how to mitigate that. Here's just another look of how this was done globally using the tropomy instrument. And so a lot has been said about tropomy, especially in part one of this uh, training about what tropomy does. And it kind of sits in this middle ground between uh, you know, a global mapper and a point source quantifier. But generally speaking, tropomy is a, uh, you know, has precision to the level about you know, 10, PP, or 10, 11 PPB of, of methane enhancement in the column. Um, and it's at a five, by, or five and a half by seven kilometer spatial resolution spatial resolution. So much coarser than uh, than what I was showing in the previous slide of three meters. I mean, a couple orders of magnitude here. But what some recent studies have found is since it's a global mapping mission, so you get, you know, a look of the entire planet basically every day, you know, obviously you have to deal with the clouds. What uh, some recent studies have found is they've said, you know what, there are some pretty dang large emitters um, that are so big that we actually can see the plumes, just like I showed in the previous slide, we can see the plumes at a five by seven kilometer spatial resolution. There's enhance, enough enhancement that extends so far downwind of that, plume, of, of that source that we're able to see it for 30, 40 kilometers. So actually tropomy is good at delineating that. 
So this starts to become very interesting because now we start saying, okay, these are you know ultra emitting events that are you know tens of thousands of kilo, uh, kilograms of methane per hour. These are events that really don't get captured in bottom up inventories because they either correspond to some major malfunction, some big bursted pipeline somewhere. Um, in fact, you can see uh, in Eastern Europe, this there's a uh, lots of plumes emanating exactly. This is correlated exactly with the major pipeline. So it can be either ruptures maybe in that pipeline or it can be process level events. So there's a pressure release. And so a lot of methane gets released to the atmosphere over a short time interval. But what becomes important is saying, well, even if it's over a short time inter interval, it's a huge volume of methane. So what does that contribute to the global budget? And some early indications suggest that these types of events could be as much as 10% of global oil and gas emissions. Um, and again, while we're on the subject of plumes here, I just wanna talk a little bit, we'll go into detail about quantification. This happens a little bit uh, more di differently than uh, what has been shown in the inversions uh, you know, that I showed previously in methane and also that Brendan showed with CO2. You're dealing with plume scale and very high resolution. So you're still relating concentrations back to emissions, but actually now you have to say something about the shape of the plume and the concentrations that extend out from the shape of the plume. And you have to be able to account in some ways for turbulence and you know what's <laughs> and what's happening in order to make that quantification. And so what I've shown here, and this is from a review paper from Daniel Jacob that's currently in review in, in atmospheric chemistry and physics, is the various ways that people do this through Gaussian plumes or mass balance, cross-sectional flux, IME, integrated methane enhancement, angular width. And then many people have actually trained neural networks, so AI machines to just be able to do this quantification. It's also a very active area of research, but it doesn't quite invoke transport models in the same way that these global flux inversions to do. Okay, so now we start thinking about, okay, this is really interesting. We got all these plumes that we're seeing, uh, you know, across the, across the earth. We have different satellite imagers that currently that can, you know, do some of this. We have airborne campaigns that can do some of that. What I will say is we don't currently have a satellite that can do what Tropomi does in terms of spatial and temporal coverage. So Tropomi, we get global maps, you know, where there's no clouds every day of methane. That's pretty incredible. Um, we don't get that at the high resolution. So thinking of different satellite missions that are current in existence, you know, uh, Prisma or GHGSAT, or some people have started to use Sentinel-2, you don't get good observations with these plumes everywhere all the time. We hope to change that in the future. In fact, there's a lot of sat exciting satellite missions coming on in the near future with the attempt to act to address the spatial and temporal sampling explicitly. But until then, we think about how do we use these in a data fusion sense? So what I'm showing here is an example of a tipping queue strategy. So on the left are you know, average concentrations that were taken from Tropomi between 2018 and 2020 uh, in Turkmenistan. And by doing this time averaging, you can start to see you know, okay, where it looked like hotspots, where there seems to be a lot of methane activity. And you see they show up as orange. It seems like there's a few discrete places where these methane hotspots, well, if I have that, I can say, okay, well, now I have a satellite that I have to go task. It doesn't see everywhere on the planet all at once, but I can task it to go look at different places. Well, then you, you're, you can be smart about it. You can say, okay, well, I see all of these trobomi hotspots in red. I'm just going to task this satellite to look at those red spots. And that's what you see here on the right is an example of this tip and cue where they said, okay, there's the trobomi hotspots. I task the satellite and look what I found. I found a bunch of plumes. So it starts telling you of an order of operations of how you might think about using remote sensing, again, to guide mitigation and even for the bottom up inventories, as you could say, okay, I'm going to take the coarse resolution, it's multiple kilometer resolution, but high spatial temporal 
to get a general sense of what's the landscape of methane in my country or in my city um, or in a oil and gas basin. And once you determine that, you could say, okay, well, it seems as if I can delineate a general hotspot area that's maybe 50 to 100 kilometers in radius. Now I'm gonna task the high resolution satellite to say, okay, where exactly is that coming from? And here I just wanted to show an example of various satellites that all kind of have a piece of this puzzle. They are all different. They have varying precision for a single column of methane. They have different spatial, they have different temporal resolutions, um, and, they, and they have different coverage of how much of the Earth that they can get in a certain day. But when we think about how are we going to tackle this problem, really it means likely using all of the above. <laughs> you can use it and being very smart about it. It's a lot of data and it's very easy to be overwhelmed by it or to, you know, use it in a not very intelligent way so it renders useless. You really have to think about, okay, what is giving me what spatial temporal? How can I use that in conjunction with another satellite? Okay, and just, um, I wanted to give a little taste as well. I talked about it a little bit, but just give a little bit more taste of what we'll be talking about in more detail in part three. Uh, we touched on it a little bit here before of, you know, how can these be used for inventories? How can this CH4 information be used for inventory? So again, just like with the uh, example I showed for the global methane done by uh, John Warden using GOSAP, observations. Here's another one that was done at higher resolution in the United States where they took uh, GOSAT observations averaged over a five-year period um, to inform a top-down inventory using the prior inventory, bottom-up inventory as a prior constraint. With that, they got fluxes. They were able to use those fluxes and some information about that prior inventory to, to separate it into different emission sectors, could compare the prior and posterior, and could then go even further with using those prior, those ratios in a bottom-up inventory to partition the top down to give a posterior estimate at each of these subsectors. And then on the right, you know, the sensitivity here, this is really important, it's hard to go in details, where they said, okay, what is the information content that I got out of my inversion system? So you can, you can actually know that this is a closed form mathematical construct, as you can see, it's called the degrees of freedom for signal that you can resolve at a spatial scale to tell you, okay, how much information came from my atmospheric observations versus how much of that information is actually purely driven from what my bottom up inventory was. And so the higher the value you have here, the more confidence that you have that it's really, um, you're, you're getting something from your top-down observations. Um, and then another example, again, for mitigation, I hinted at this with the Permian example, but here's another example from a uh, field campaign that my team undertook in the denver Julesburg Basin in Colorado. So we were flying over the denver Julesburg Basin in Colorado and we saw this plume on the left coming you know, just south of a well pad. And we said, okay, that looks like a pipeline. I don't know. And we flew it, actually flew it eight times over the course of a week. And we just kept seeing it. It was persistent. So we gave it to the state, the state of Colorado, the Department of uh, Public Health and Environment. We also gave it to collaborators we have at Colorado State University. And they went out in vans and they went around looking for it. And this picture in the middle is a uh, them on the ground just south of that well pad. And what they found was this area of dead grass just off the road that seemed to be indicative of a spill. There was kind of a, you know, spilled oil on here. And they said, well, if there's a place, there's, there's a leak, that's it. And they went around and they dug and they looked and, you know, sure enough, they found a, you know, half inch little hole in a pipeline and were able to correct it and issued a report on it. So again, this starts to become, you know, this, this takes, we call this a, you know, the handoff challenge or, or, you know, how do you hand off this data? But again, we're starting from the remote sensing. That's getting us with the airborne to within a few, you know, tens of meters 
you give that to the right agencies, they can follow up with their ground surveys and do some sort of remediation. So this isn't really about inventories, this is about mitigation, but it's an example you know, of how these satellite observations can be used to inform something on the ground aimed at mitigation. Um, and then again, going kind of back to the point sources, what do these, these uh, you know, low precision, I don't want to say low precision, but what do the high spatial resolution plume emissions that we're able to quantify with the lower precision instruments, how much do they actually contribute to the total budget? And that's a really important question for inventories. As we're talking about, I said, okay, do we need to start thinking about emission factors that take into account these plumes? Well, if those plumes are actually a drop in the bucket compared to a whole inventory, uh, maybe not. You know, you say, oh, this is just happens once in a while. It's not a big deal. Let's not put it into an inventory. If they do, maybe we re need to rethink our inventories a little bit. So what I'm showing here is an analysis we did across multiple basins over multiple years where the blue lines represent the top-down fluxes that we got from tropomi. These represent an area, the total area flux, the mixture of the diffuse and the point sources, the natural, the anthropogenic, anything that emits methane within this domain. So here is, you know, uh, sorry for the acronyms, but San Joaquin Valley in California, the Permian Basin in Texas, the Uinta Basin in in Utah, the Denver Julesburg in Colorado, and the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania and West Virginia. And so the blue represents that total flux. We quantified using a, a more formal inversion of methane from tropomi. The panel in the middle represents the sum of all of those plumes, those point sources that we quantified, and it's colored by the sector where we quantified it. And and then the panel on the right is the bottom-up inventory comparison that we had in the United States. So again, this kind of tells you all of the, the, the parts of the, the pie, right? The, the left bar is the total flux from the atmosphere, the right bar is the total flux from the bottom-up inventory, and the middle bar are the point sources that we quantify totally independent. And what we find is that the point sources make up about 20 to 60% of the budget. So in areas where you would expect there could be point sources, this is not every sector. This is only in those, what I pointed to in the beginning, these kind of point sourcey sectors. So fossil fuel, uh, agriculture, and really in agriculture, it's manure management, not enteric fermentation, and, uh, and waste, so landfills or wastewater treatment. If there's a, that mixture of sector within an area, what we're finding, at least from these you know, five basins we looked at, is that the point sources make up um, you know, 20 to 60% of the budget, so a, a non-trivial component and of, of that budget. So it's something to keep in mind when we think about how these inventories are created. Okay, I'm gonna leave it uh, more or less there, but I just wanted to leave with a few take-home messages here and you know hopefully this what's our appetite for the next part as we dive a little bit deeper into how these can be used um, this information can be used but just to just take a step back and look at what we learned just want to say that for methane um, you know it's like co2 that we can get budgets from satellite observations we have you know, global mapping satellites that do a good job, not perfect, nothing's perfect, but do a good job of constraining a top-down budget with the various caveats that apply to constraining those budgets, which, you know, can include, okay, how good, you know, uh, you know, how biased are your atmospheric observations, how good is your transport model, and, you know, how good are the priors as well. Unlike CO2, though, uh, the main sink of methane is the hydroxyl radical, atmospheric OH. It simplifies the problem in some ways, but it actually also complicates it in others because there's a lot of uncertainty in that OH. And, you know, small deviations in OH actually have a huge, how we parameterize that can have a huge impact into what we think of as the global methane budget. Um, it's really important to remember, the third point, it's really important to remember methane as being, uh, uh, emitted from both diffuse and localized point sources. And that you need to have observations or observing systems that can respond to both of these 
So a high precision satellite is gonna be better suited for being able to constrain kind of a regional inversion or regional total flux, which would include the diffuse sources. Um, but the lower precision, fine resolution satellites, they're not gonna get at every sector. They, they, they're gonna have a really hard time getting, getting a wetland. But they're gonna do a really good job at geolocating and quantifying localized point sources that you know, sometimes get called super emitters. And that's really important for us understanding you know, the, uh, the impact of those types of events on local budgets and also for informing mitigation. Okay, and, and yeah, that's basically the last point I wanted to leave you with is that when we have this balance between spatial resolution and precision, that really opens up two driving use cases. And one is inventories, comparisons for inventories, and the other is mitigation. And we can do both, but it is a complicated problem to fuse these data sets together. And then once you have to hand these, this information off to the right parties to do something about it. Okay, thank you so much, and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A. Okay, uh, I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Um, so this is just briefly before we get into the, the question and answer. Um, I wanted to show everyone where they could download the CO2 data set that we've generated. and. Um, in part three, we're going to go through a little demo of how to to use um, this data set. So this uh, data set is stored on the um, this website, which is hosted by the Committee of Earth Observing Satellites. So it's uh, ceos.org slash gst slash carbon dioxide at html. Um, and it's also available with the course materials um, next to the slides for part two on the RSET training website. All right, so now I'll uh, go to this website. So what you can see here is that there is a, a data description providing some more information about this data set and how it's constructed, kind of similar to what we covered today. And then on the right, under a download link, you can download a CSV file with the country totals. Um, since I'm here, it, I, it's worth pointing out as well that just if you go to the GST portion of the CIOS website, it has a number of other data sets that you can look at um, around the global stock take. All right, so once you've downloaded this data set, you will see that there is um, so it's a CSV file that you can open in Excel or whatever you'd like. Um, it has, you know, its name is the data set for RSET training, and my contact information, and then it has the different variables listed here um, that are provided. And then it has uh, the, in each row, each of these variables kind of in order. So you have the country code, and then the year, and then the different uh, flux variables. So for example, here, this is showing for Afghanistan. You have 2015, 2016 through 2020, and then you have the mean across these six years. So I encourage everyone to, to take a look at the data sets and try you know, plotting some stuff up for yourself before um, we go through the tutorial in part three. Below is the contact information for Dr. Byrne and Dr. Cussworth should you want to follow up with them about anything you heard during today's webinar. You can find all the information about the training, including links to download the materials on the training website shown below. And please check out the many other trainings we have available on the RSET website. We encourage you to also follow us on Twitter to stay informed about upcoming trainings and events. We will now transition to the question and answer portion of today's webinar. Please enter your questions in the question and answer box. We will answer them in the order they were received. We will post the question and answer document to the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. Thank you.
Brandon, thank you so much for, for demonstrating how to access that data from the CIOS website. Um, so wonderful, everybody. Thank you for sticking around. We will jump right into the question and answer portion of today's training. So question number one, and this is referring to slide 11. What are the estimated uncertainties? On estimated uncertainties on the flux values listed, and how are these uncertainties estimated? Um, so there are a, a few different things here. One is that the, um, so this, this was in reference to kind of these large scale fluxes I listed for the biosphere in the ocean and anthropogenic uh, emissions. So for anthropogenic emissions, um, for fossil fuels, this is typically done, you know, bottom up by, you know, how much uh, fossil fuels is bought and then an emission ratio to the burning of the fossil fuels to estimate the emissions. And the uncertainty on that is, is relatively low, kind of in the order of five, 10%, depending on the country. Um, then the other component of the anthropogenic emissions, of course, this land use change uh, emissions, which, which has a considerably higher uncertainty, kind of on the order of 60%. Now for the, for the biosphere, and ocean, um, these one-way fluxes are um, a little challenging to estimate because, you know, the, the atmosphere is changed by the net flux, not the one-way flux. Uh, so for the for gross primary productivity, there's a, a number of different ways to estimate globally how much carbon is sequestered through photosynthesis. This includes running uh, terrestrial ecosystem models, um, using remote sensing and, and uh, modeling the uptake through that. Um, as well as using things like site level measurements from eddy covariance sites and trying to estimate global uh, values from that. And so the uncertainty on the one way uh, photosynthesis is considerable. It, it can be, you know, up to 100%. It's, it's, it's really an estimate on kind of the magnitude, um, I would say. Um, for for the oceans, I believe it's, it's done with models and partial pressure. Um, estimates as well. I know Dave, if you uh, uh, might know slightly more about that than I do. Um, but the, yeah, I think the one way estimates are basically taken off these partial pressure uh, measurements and, and also, you know, um, models of ocean circulation. Um, Great, thank you, Brendan. And question yeah, I could I, I could go into a treatise on this, but I don't think we have time right now, uh, Brendan. Um, but um, uh, I think the the answer there actually is the this. Is the oh, Dave, we lost you. No, I was I was just saying that the. Uh, the the actual answer in the in the the uh, of the question in the chat there uh, is probably the the right question or the right answer for for now. Uh, we could go into great detail on how the actual measurements and models are combined uh, for making flux estimates over the ocean. Um, these measurements are are very difficult. We make individual measurements of the uh, of the acidity of the ocean. Uh, throughout the ocean basins on decadal time scales. These are combined into large catalogs. Those catalogs are then analyzed with a series of models to upscale the measurements to from point measurements to the, the one by one degree boxes uh, uh, across the ocean. Only about 1% of the one by one degree boxes are actually covered right now, but that still gives us good measurements uh, over the oceans. Those data are then further analyzed with global ocean uh, biogeochemical models to estimate fluxes, and we're getting uh, right now the global average is shown here is about 13 percent. Okay, thank you, Dave and Brennan. Uh, question number two, this is referring to slide 21. What kinds of observation stations are shown as swath uh, as a swath of pixels in the Pacific? Yes, uh, sorry. So this is uh, this is on me. Uh, I, I forgot to describe that. So. Um, as in that plot, the circles are showing these kind of long-term stations, which are, you know, at a building or a certain site where it's being measured. What I showed as those kind of lines um, are are kind of moving uh, measurements. So, 
uh, over the Pacific Ocean, you have these collected through through ships uh, that participate in dedicated measurement campaigns um, and, and ships of opportunity. So some cargo ships have, have these measurements. Um, and then there's also uh, aircraft uh, measurements over this. So, uh, you know, one one example is uh, CO2 measurements on commercial aircraft, which is, uh, you know, run in a program called Contrail, which is run by Japan. Terrific, thanks. Uh, question number three, what are some causes of the possible biases from the information uh, uh, GOGIS provides, and are there currently works of reducing them to have more accurate information? So, uh, Dave, I, I don't know if you'd prefer to cover this, you're more of the expert, um, but... I could pick this up, Brendan, if you would yeah. like. Uh, and as, you, as you've stated here, I think very correctly, um, there are really a number of, of possible sources of bias uh, in the CO2 measurements that we're making from space. Uh, and because we know that, uh, and these, these biases ba basically include uh, uncertainties in, in how much light is absorbed by carbon dioxide molecules or by oxygen molecules, which we use as a reference. There are also clouds and aerosols in the atmosphere. Aerosols are just fine particles, mists, for example, uh, that, that uh, complicate the measurement and, and add uncertainties uh, in the atmospheric path length that the, that the photons are traveling through the atmosphere. And that, that compromises our, our, um, our, the accuracy of our, our estimates. But in spite of those challenges, we're actually making measurements that are incredibly accurate. They're typically accurate to somewhere along the earth, somewhere around the range of about three tenths of 1%. Uh, so those are very, very accurate measurements. Uh, the precision of the measurements is actually about twice that good. So we're making uh, typically 0.15% uh, is the typical uh, precision of these measurements uh, that we're making. So the, the real challenge uh, over the, um, the ocean, though, for the flux measurements isn't, is, is basically something that uh, has to do with the, with the fluxes themselves. The oceans are very large, and the fluxes over them uh, at any given place or, or time over the ocean, the fluxes are very, very weak. Uh, and so the differences in CO2 that we're measuring associated with those fluxes are really, really small, typically on the order of a tenth of 1%. So if we have even the smallest bias in the measurement, the smallest uh, error, uh, systematic error in the measurements, even on the order of a tenth of a percent, we completely hide or can and actually get the wrong sign uh, on the fluxes. And so that's why our flux team uh, has uh, flagged the ocean glint measurements uh, as problematic. It's not because they're bad, they're actually better than, as good or better than the land measurements and their absolute accuracy. It's just that the quantity we're measuring is so tiny. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Dave. Uh, question number four, when you aggregate the one by one degree net carbon exchange grid squares by country, are you taking a simple sum of all the grids that fall within each country, or is there a more complex aggregation method to arrive at the country? Yes, yeah, so what we do is so we just have a, say a flux, you know, of uh, grams per meter squared per second or whatever. So I first multiply that, uh, that flux by the area of the grid cell. Uh, so, you know, one by one degree grid cells have slightly different area as you move towards the poles. Um, and then I just sum over those grid cells uh, in the outline of the country, basically. Um, there is an important uh, point here though. Um, so one thing is that these individual inversion systems can sometimes have correlations between different grid cells that they, uh, for fluxes they estimate. So it's kind of the correct way to estimate these country totals is to take each of these uh, OCO2 MIP ensemble members and calculate the country total for each of them first so that we ha then have you know, 12 estimates of the country total fluxes. And then uh, from those 12 country totals, you calculate the median and standard deviation. So that's kind of the algorithm that we use to get to it. Great, thanks, Brennan. Question number five. In some places, the net carbon exchange calculated median and uncertainty are in equal range. Any reason for it, as we may need to expect that the uncertainty be less? 
Yeah, so this, I guess, um, in some ways depends on how large the net uh, carbon exchange is. Um, if you have a very small net carbon exchange, then it's easier to have uncertainties that are as large as the net carbon exchange. Um, and so, you know, this, if we start to get uncertainties that are comparable to the magnitude of net carbon exchange, when we get to, to kind of small countries where it can be very hard to distinguish one country from another um, with the, the still relatively sparse measurements that we have um, today of CO2. So, you know, there, as you try to estimate fluxes, you know, especially as you get smaller fluxes over a smaller area, um, you know, your uncertainties get larger because it's harder to really isolate those fluxes in our inversion systems. So I hope that answers the question. Great, thanks, I can Brandon. add one more small, I can add one more small yeah, point. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, and it, it's, it's, everybody has to remember that what we're developing here and what we're showing here are a series of pilot uh, national flux budgets uh, derived from available data from the from the spacecraft and ground-based systems uh, that we have flying today. Uh, this is a first-generation effort uh, that we're putting together here. It's the it's the first, not the last, and best uh, flux estimates that we'll ever get. As time goes on, uh, especially the resolute, the spatial resolution, temporal resolution, and the coverage of the measurements we're going to be getting from space and from the ground will improve, and we will be getting uh, progressively finer and finer estimates uh, of fluxes uh, over time. So in this stock take, we this is what we have. Uh, this is the first stock take, and all of us are are working on a best effort basis. As we go into the future, we're going to be getting much better uh, coverage, much better resolution, and we'll be able to get much finer estimates of fluxes. Um, and so the uncertainties are expected to from these top-down budgets are expected to go down uh, fairly rapidly over time. I hope that helps as well. Thank you, Dave. Question number six: No emissions from Russia with results per country. So I think I think this is referring to the net, net carbon exchange emissions, and so. Yeah, what you see in terms of the net carbon exchange over um, some of these kind of northern extropical slash high latitude countries such as Russia and Canada is that there is uh, the net carbon exchange is pretty small. So it's it's roughly close to zero. And the reason for this is that there is is uptake happening by the biosphere. So there's um, increasing terrestrial carbon stocks, which is roughly uh, uh, of the same magnitude of the anthropogenic emissions from these countries. Um, an important point here is that the, so, um, you know, I've, I didn't really get into detail for why there are these, this uptake in emissions uh, across these different countries. In some cases we know, some cases we don't know, but, um, you know, this, this uptake across, you know, Russia and Canada is not really uh, has, have anything to do with the, uh, management or uh, policies being taken by those governments. We know both Canada and Russia are relatively uh, large per capita emitters of anthropogenic emissions, but instead there is this kind of diffuse large-scale uptake occurring across boreal forests that we believe is due to a combination of uh, CO2 fertilization and uh, warming in these reasons, which is causing the biosphere to be more um, active. And so there is this large kind of um, sequestration of carbon into the uh, terrestrial biosphere occurring over these countries, but is not really uh, have anything to do with those countries' um, you know, policies for, for managing carbon. Uh, yeah, I hope that, that helps. I'm not sure if anyone would like to add anything. Great, question number seven. Why are the flux estimates more uncertain in smaller countries? Yeah, so this is this is a great question. And, and you know, as Dave mentioned before, this is something that we think, you know, we can improve on substantially over the coming years uh, as, you know, more measurements come up and we, we improve the retrievals in these inversion systems. So there's several factors here. One um, is observational gaps. So, you know, as I showed in those videos 
uh, before, we're not measuring all the countries like everywhere all the time. There are gaps in our, our data. And so, you know, with the sparseness, you're you have a much easier time making measurements over a big country like Russia than you do over a smaller country, say Cambodia. So part of it is just that we don't have all the measurements uh, to measure everything. The other factor is that, you know, over larger countries, you generally have the you know emissions that build up over space and so you see a larger signal in the atmosphere over smaller countries you have a pretty small area for fluxes to occur and so generally you don't change the atmospheric co2 concentration as much from emissions from smaller countries and, and for that reason plus combined with how close these small countries are to each other it can be quite challenging to um, say for sure that some you know change you measure in atmospheric co2 came from uh, one small country versus another small country right next to it. So so it can be harder to um, attribute to, to the smaller countries uh, from sparse data. Great, question number eight. Um, the negative, i.e. land carbon gain across northern high latitudes, does this gain account for wildfires? Yes, that's right. So we do account for um, wildfires in our estimates. So. As I was showing those equations before, we have this net biosphere exchange, which we subtract uh, lateral fluxes from. So that net biosphere exchange includes a uh, net ecosystem exchange and wildfires. So, so they are included in those estimates. Great, hey, thank you. Question number nine. Are ocean glint data from OCO2 particularly suspect, or are ocean glint data generally of questionable quality across lots of different CO2 methane satellites? We'd love to hear more about what makes ocean glint data useful slash high quality or I, I think I can take that one again um, as I mentioned above uh, this is really the same issue the the precision and accuracy of the ocean glint data for OCO2 is as high as that over land as far as we know there is some question of in, in our ability to actually quantify the, the the accuracy over the ocean because there's just nothing to compare it to. So there, there are no very, very few uh, uh, surface measurements being taken. So uh, we're in the process now of, of improving the coverage uh, and the quality of the ocean surface data so that we can uh, actually understand the accuracy of the OCO2 uh, glint data. Uh, better and also identify biases in the data and and maybe the sources of those biases so that our teams uh, can improve the data. But right now, as far as we know, the accuracy of the data over the ocean is just as high as it is over the land. The problem really is that from a flux uh, inversion standpoint, the fluxes are just tiny over the ocean compared to over the land. Uh, we don't have, you know, smokestacks over the ocean pouring CO2 into the air. So uh, we, we actually need much more precise and accurate data over the ocean uh, to, to quantify these very weak but spatially extensive flux sources or sinks. Uh, and so we're working on that, and that is one of the primary uh, uh, efforts that's ongoing within the OCO2 team uh, and uh, also the GOSAT team the Japanese GOSAT team, and also uh, among other teams around the world. So I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Dave. Question number 10. Does the LNL GOGIS inverse modeling experiment include emissions from the maritime transport sector, i.e. vessels? Uh, yeah, so um, in our simulation where we do, you know, as I showed, we have that um, you know, atmospheric transport model where we simulate what CO2 should be like. We we prescribe what um, we expect the fossil fuel emissions to be like from a data set called ODF. And so that has, uh, you know, estimates of the emissions due to vessels um, over the ocean. Now, when we're in our, what we're trying to optimize in that data set is really kind of, um, where we're more sensitive to these kind of larger scale, you know, total country emissions. And so in those inversion analyses, we can't really say say much about how much is being emitted from, from these maritime transport sector, um, but it is incorporated in our um, inversion system. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that answers that. Um, 
Question? Question 11, counterintuitive, as the tropical countries with forest are the ones with highest carbon stock loss. Am I understanding right? Yeah, so, um, yeah, great question. I think, I think there's a, a few uh, points to cover here. Um, so, so first off, yes, uh, that, that is generally um, what, what it is showing. Um, so one thing is, is to just, you know, reinforce the difference between a carbon stock and a flux. So, um, you know, one reason this might be counterintuitive is that we're really looking at the flux. So we're looking at carbon, uh, you know, released from the carbon stocks. And so that that's not really comment on how big the carbon stocks are. So many of these tropical countries do have very large car carbon stocks. Um, but they also have this, this carbon stock loss over this period that we see. Um, one reason why it might be a bit counterintuitive is that you know, our estimates of carbon stock loss include um, anthropogenic impacts such as land use change. So in a lot of places in the tropics that there's quite a lot of, of deforestation. And so this is something that contributes um, to this, uh, this loss of carbon stocks. And Kind of finally, one more point to make is that the period we're looking at here, 2015 to 2020, um, had had one of the largest El Nino events on record. And so these El Ninos are typically associated with uh, carbon loss in the tropics. And so that might uh, partially impact by we, why we see such large carbon loss in the tropics over this period. And so it's, um, you know, it's a little uncertain to say what we'll see from the tropics over the next five, six years. So yeah, I hope that answers if anyone else had anything to say here. Thank you, Brennan. Uh, question number 12, our OCO2 estimates of NCE will be provided for uh, from 2020 to 2025. So yes, uh, yes, we're, we're hoping to continue providing regular updates. Um, you know, we're working on exactly how, how this will work, but hopefully, we can produ produce something annually. Uh, so as long as OCO2 keeps measuring, we can keep uh, producing. Um, you know, an another point here to make um, is that, you know, there's a lot more of these uh, uh, measurements coming online and a lot of planned missions um, that can be folded into this type of analysis. So, you know, the, the plan is to uh, continue this type of analysis and keep on improving it and refining it, as Dave mentioned earlier, and hopefully, you know, cutting down some of those uncertainties as we move into the 2025 period. Okay, question 13 refers to slide 40. So methane emissions emission from China. What is the reason for this? In fact, hardly any data is observed for China. Um, yeah, I can just speak to that quickly. Um, Yes, slide 40 is a it's a model result of strictly wetland methane emissions, and so it's not doesn't encompass all of the sectors. So certainly there's, and it doesn't actually include rice paddies either, which are you know, anthropogenic wetlands. So it's not a it's not a full representation. But the point of the slide is to say for that emission source, where there are, are wetlands, they're usually spread across very large areas, um, which necessitate you know a, a particular observing strategy. Um, so that's all. Great, thanks, Dan. Question number 14. Could we say that CO2 space-based measurements with medium spectral resolution, i.e. a large swath, are adapted for long-term CO2 monitoring and methane space-based uh, space -based measurements with high spectral resolution and a narrow swath are adapted for short-term monitoring and alarm detection? So I can take a stab at this. Um, I would say, yeah. I mean, I think you could say that you can you can kind of do you can kind of do both depending on the type of instrument you have. At least for the methane, as we're talking, you know, there's two different classes here, and so um, you know, the high spectral resolution, global, you know, precise measurement, global mapping can certainly be done for long-term methane monitoring, and that's currently what's being done with top-down global inventories that were shown in this. Um, in this presentation. Um, but when we go to the coarser spectral resolution, high spatial resolution instruments, you really take a hit in the precision, but because of the spatial resolution, you can start to delineate particular plumes. So that 
gets you at, you know, you know, I don't know necessarily about short term, but certainly about alarm monitoring, given the caveats that in order to do, you know, successful alarm monitoring, you also have to be considering, you know, things like spatial and temporal revisit of these core spe spectral resolution satellites. So I think the answer is both. Um, you know, for CO2, it's the nature of it's a little bit different, even if, uh, but it, it, it ultimately comes down to, you know, the, what are the types of measurements that you have and what types of systems do they, um, are they, do they address? We'll show in part three, you know, you can do power plant level CO2 monitoring as well with really coarse spectral resolution instruments. That's not as much alarm detection, but that is high spatial. Um, but certainly the use case is much more of what Brendan's been talking about, about these global stock takes. So. Wonderful. Thank you, Dan. The short, answer, the short answer to that question, though, is that we need to use every tool in the box because we're trying to measure both sources and uptake by sinks that, that actually generate a very broad range of fluxes from very, very weak, spatially extensive fluxes to very intense point fluxes. So we do need to use every every tool in the box here. Absolutely. of resolution to sensitivity for methane emitters that are not essentially ultra emitters, but not very small either. Say for instance, coal mines or landfills and manufacturing industries. Yeah, so th this is a great question. I mean, so you can think of this as an emission distribution of, you know, what, what, you know, what is the curve uh, probability distribution of all the different emitters you have? And so some of the slides that I showed were these ultra emitters that were so large that you could see the plumes with something like Tropomi, which is a more coarse resolution satellite. But because the plumes were so large, they were showing up very clearly on Tropomi. Um, certainly there's a large class of emitters that are also large, but don't quite rise to that level. But because they don't quite rise to that level, you wouldn't see a single plume in Tropomi. So you'd need something finer resolution. And you know, there's many examples of that um, from the airborne campaigns. And so um, if you go, back to slide 48 you know we there's a graphic there that tries to partition you know as best as it can between um satellites and it's really based on you know the spatial resolution of the instruments so the the coarser resolution global mappers that can be used for these these flux studies and then the point source imagers and so things like coal mines and landfills um or you know even oil and gas emissions that you know aren't tens of thousands of kilograms an hour, but you know, maybe hundreds of kilograms an hour, are certainly within the ballpark of what's planned for uh, future satellite missions. And there's currently missions that can address these types of these types of emitters. But again, it gets back to the, you know, the great thing about Tropomi is that you're getting these these daily snapshots. So you're getting global coverage. And so when you were getting now at the small when we're when we're getting at the really high resolution, we lose that global daily coverage. And so just remembering that when we think of how do we address this other class of, you know, large super emitters that aren't, you know, ultra, ultra emitters. Thank you, Dan. Uh, looking at the time, we are now at the top of the hour. Uh, it's a, incredible how fast those two hours flew by. Uh, we want to thank all the participants for joining us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the second part of this three-part webinar series. Uh, again, our final and third part will be next Wednesday. We do hope you'll join us next week for the third and final part of this webinar series. And I also want to uh, thank Dr. Brendan Byrne, Dr. Daniel for contributing to today's training. And I wanted to give the three of them any opportunity to have any uh, thoughts or closing words for our attendees today. No, uh, just thanks everyone for participating. Um, you know, yeah, for sure, feel free to, to email me or, or the others. Um, if, if you'd like some more information and uh, we'll see you all for part three. Seconded. Thanks so much. And thanks all. Great. Thank you. And I also want to acknowledge the RSET team. Uh, that is uh, Jonathan O'Brien, Mel Melanie Folletta O'Cook, Selwyn Hudson O'Doy, and Brock Blevins uh, for supporting this training. And we hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you.